Welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, please drop a comment or a like or a wave so I know who's here and I can formally welcome you. My hope today we have a really full session. Of, uh, we're going to share a lot of ideas and practical tips. I will be sharing a lot of my own and I think we will have the most value of today's session if people are also sharing in the comments. So I would love to know Know who I'm talking to. I do also want to make sure that I am talking to folks in the out of school time community. I've been doing videos all week. I will continue doing videos this week and all of them uh, there is value for lots of people uh, but some of them are catered to specific interests and this one is for my OST folks out there. So if you are in out of school time, also if you're an educator, or you're working somehow in the human service sector, there will be value today, but we will be talking a lot very specifically for our youth development people. So I want to make sure that this is the right live for you. I'm seeing some likes and thumbs up, so that tells me I have the right people in the room. My name is Catherine Spinney. I'm so grateful to have you join us. Again, I, I'm hoping to keep this as interactive as possible in the comments. I'm new to live streaming. I don't always catch all the comments or respond in time, but the value is that other people can read your comments, including when the live is finished. This video gets posted, it can be shared, and, and your comments live on. <laughs> and the resources you share, the ideas you share, will benefit those in the out of school time community. So don't be shy. Uh, please feel free to drop your questions, your comments, your ideas, your thoughts in the, com in the comments section. If I don't get to it during this, I promise I go back and look at the comments and follow up accordingly. I also encourage you to respond to other people's comments. I have been doing this work for a long time, but I certainly don't know everything, so we learn by sharing resources with each other. Hey, Michelle, good to see you again. Um, good, perfect. So you're the Director of Extended Learning. Where, where are you coming in from, Michelle? That might help us a little bit. Uh, and so I would love to hear, uh, before we dive right in, what are some of your most burning questions and concerns about how to best support your out of school time team during this time? I've been hearing from some people that they don't know what to do. <laughs> they don't know how to provide meaningful work for their staffs, which is why I'm here. My goal by the end of this session is that you go from I don't know what to do to how do I do all of this stuff because now I have so many ideas of what I can do with my staff during this time that is valuable, not busy work, right? Our students don't like busy work. We don't like busy work. Our staffs don't like busy work. So my goal is by the end of this session, you are going to walk away and say, I have so many ideas about what to do with my out of school time staff. So as you drop in, please say hello, give me a wave, introduce yourself to the group, and uh, let us know how you're doing. Oh, Holyoke, Mass. I am from Mass. So I live in Baltimore, Massachusetts. Balt Baltimore, Massachusetts. I live in Baltimore, Maryland now, but I am from um, Boston, the North Shore area and so socio-emotional learning, beautiful. Uh, and yeah, I am from the North Shore area, so very nice to have a fellow Massachusetts person. There's Amanda, good to see you, Amanda. So um, in addition to today's session, I also want to let you know that I am doing a great experiment with live streaming. So hey, Honor, wonderful to virtually see you. Thanks for being here. So I am and uh, Missouri, thanks for being here from Missouri. So I am also doing this session live at four o'clock on Twitter. This is my first foray into live streaming and I, Lynn, right next door, love it. Baltimore, Maryland, hey Reggie, great to see you. So, um, 
Yeah, so I am intentionally doing this live because I don't, um, I am not used to this, right? My entire career, I've been a teacher, I'm a coach, a trainer, a workshop facilitator, all those things where you get to have this beautiful interaction with the folks who are in the room. Another Baltimore, awesome, hey AJ. So um, I thought about doing pre-recorded video. It does go a little bit smoother when you're doing it pre-recorded, but it's just so so weird. It's really weird to talk into a camera and just be talking into a camera. So seeing your faces, your waves, your likes, uh, it, it really helps to keep it as natural as it can be. And in that spirit, because we're live and natural, my cat might be running through. There was construction all morning. My Baltimore folks know what that is like when there's constant construction outside. So we are going to do the absolute best we can to make this a great session for you. Again, I encourage you to Washington DC. All right, Lee, good to have Washington here. I see Amanda's here. I know she's from Tennessee, so we are all over. North Carolina, hey Sally, good to see you. So uh, in addition to today, today's session, again, you can feel free to um, share the video once it's done with your colleagues. I'll also be live on Twitter at four. And then tomorrow, same time, I'm at on Instagram at 10 in the morning, here at 1, Twitter at 4. Tomorrow we're focusing on my leaders, which is most of you, and we'll do an abbreviated version of my very long um, uh, coursework, which is the four main components of effective leadership. So I encourage you to join that. And then on Friday, we're, sh we're switching gears a little bit. I'm also a certified coach, and lots of people come to me with lots of questions about what coaching is? Do they want to be coached? Do they maybe want to become a coach at some point in their lives? How do I use coaching skills with my staff and with my students? So we will be doing all things coaching on Friday. I welcome you to join us then. So once again, my name is Catherine Spinney. I'm so grateful that you joined us today. And this is going to be, um, I have it scheduled for an hour. It, I, I, I don't know, I'm still working with the timing. Initially it was 30 minutes and there's just been so much to talk about here. So if you need to jump on and off, I understand. Uh, you can watch the replay when it's done, but there is a lot of meat <laughs> to today session. So why are we doing today's session? It's always important in everything we do to ask why. So there is a very practical, functional reason that we need to be concerned about keeping our out-of-school time staff occupied <laughs> during this time. And um, the practical reason is we need our programs to survive this, right? We, for our youth, for our families, for our communities, we have to figure out a way to work through all of the craziness and unprecedented challenges in our way to keep our doors open. They're not open right now, literally, but metaphorically, we need to make sure that our organization survives this. Thankfully, we are a field filled with people who are dedicated and passionate and resourceful and resilient. I am confident we are going to do that. So we need to keep the wheels turning, right? We know that this is not some extended vacation. We know that we need to continue have money coming in and getting our grants written and uh, figuring out how to keep our programs running. And that includes supporting our frontline staffs, the heart and and soul of the work that we do and making sure they get paid. So that is on a human level, right? We want to make sure people are surviving this. And it's also on an organizational level. We cannot do this work without our frontline staffs. And so we need to find ways not just to keep them busy, not just to justify why we are paying them. We are going to provide so much value to our frontline staffs during this time. And it will be such an easy justification, okay? And my hope is all of these wonderful things we're learning and doing and growing during this time, they transfer back to our organizations when we are on the other side of this. There are some things we're only doing now because we have to make it through this situation, but so much of the learning and growth, we can take it back to our organizations to be bigger and better than before. So that's my hope today. 
and we are going to get started because we have a lot to talk about. I do want to say I'm going to be sharing a lot of resources verbally. I'm not going to be able to type. I'm not that <laughs> that technically savvy with this yet. So um, if someone wants to jot down some of the resources I'm saying so the people in the chat can see it. Otherwise, I'll go back at the end and physically write write them out so you have access to those. Are we ready to get started? I'm ready. I'm excited. Okay, so we are going to frame this conversation in the in a bigger picture and sort of this extended analogy of where most of us are physically <laughs> at this moment, which is home. Okay, most of us are in our own homes or in the home of someone we know and love. And because of this pandemic, we have been put in a situation personally that most of us has, have never been in before. And ready, all right, AJ's ready. So I'm going to use throughout today's session this extended metaphor of getting our house in order. Okay, so a lot of us are experiencing this phenomenon of getting our houses in order personally. Okay, so a lot of us have been home for a long time and all of a sudden we're realizing that we haven't cleaned out our cabinets in a while. Our junk drawer is overflowing. There's dust bunnies in places we never knew dust bunnies could exist. So a lot of us have been spending time cleaning, right? I went through my cabinets the other day. I, I would be so embarrassed to tell you how old some of those boxes and cans were. So I am going to um, I'm going to leave that for a conversation for another day. But we're going to use this as our first step, right? When we talk about cleaning, that this is a time to clean out some of our junk. Hey, Waco. Um, so here we're going to clean up some of the junk that is going on in our programs and our organizations. And I always think of this as like going through a closet, right? And when you finally tackle that closet and it's really messy and junky in there and there's boxes and all sorts of sports equipment and whatever's in there and it's really messy. But when you take everything out of the closet, initially it feels messier, right? Like it was messy before, but it was a little bit hidden. You didn't have to stare at it in the face. And all of a sudden you take everything out of the closet and it's a hot mess. And now you're thinking, what did I just do, right? It was so much better before. Look at all this junk. So that's gonna happen when you start cleaning up your programs too. Be prepared. Even though you're aware of some messiness now, when you start digging, into the messiness it's like whoa what did I just do but in order to get clean you have to go through the mess right and so once you look at that big old mess in your closet you start to say I think I'll keep this I think I need to get rid of this I think someone else may benefit from this right so we're going to use that analogy during this time, and this is where your staff comes in to support you of cleaning up the mess that is in your organization and in your program. I'm quite sure you are running wonderfully effective, impactful programs. However, we all have room and space to get better. And, and something I hear from my out of school community all the time is how busy things are, how crazy things are, how we don't have the opportunity to do all these things we wish we could do. Here's your opportunity. We have a time to take a deep breath, to take a step back and really dig into everything we're doing in our programs and figure out how to clean them up and make them better. So this starts from your staffing, okay? How are you hiring your staff? What is your hiring process like? You have frontline staff who can tell you exactly what it's like to be hired by you, exactly what it's like to go through your interview process. Ask them, right? This is a really valuable exercise you can do with them. In the same vein, 
What is your orientation process like? What is your professional development process like? How are you supporting and training your staff as they are with you? What are your team meetings like? What are your one-on-one -on -one meetings like, right? You have this opportunity to just look at every piece of your programs and your organization, and you know how many moving parts there are to your organization and your program where can you start digging in and cleaning up the mess? So reach out to your staff and and you can do it in whatever format works for you. If you are getting on video chats with people, if you're sending documents and surveys to people, if you have Google Docs going with people or text chains, there's all sorts of ways people are staying connected. Whatever works for you, again, ask your staff what's working for them and how you can continue your work and communication. But start to go into all the aspects of your program. In addition to your staffing, um, you can talk about your volunteer program. Most of us really survive by, by using volunteers in our program. How is your volunteer program going? How can you make it stronger? How are you effectively using uh, uh, volunteers right now? How could you better be using volunteers? There is a whole world, in addition to volunteers, of interns out there. Are any of you using interns in your program? And if not, why not? <laughs> There's a lot of universities who have programs where they can connect you with university students on the undergraduate and graduate level that can help you in your programs. And uh, I, I use a lot of social work interns over the years in my programs who are interested in working in communities. So how can you clean up your volunteer slash intern support uh, to help your program. And certainly, importantly, looking and dissecting your program. What is going on with your program? You have this opportunity from the minute you advertise and enroll and welcome and serve the youth and families in your program to dissect and clean up every piece of that program, right? How are you attracting youth to your program? How are you welcoming families to your program? What is your registration process like? What is your welcoming process like? How are you orienting folks to your program? When your kids walk in the door every day, what is the sign-in process like? How are you making them feel welcome? What does your program space look like? That probably needs some physical actual cleaning, right? If your program space looks anything like mine used to. When they do their snack time, how is that going? When they do homework time, how is that going? What does the enrichment look like? What does the physical activity look like? How are you creating a safe, inclusive space for all of your students? So you have the opportunity with your staff to dig into that mess, right? And you can do it in lots of ways. You can do these big group staff discussions and each day look at a different component of the program. You could assign individual areas to individual staff or have them pair up or do small groups or whatever and say, I really want you to think about how we're doing snack every Every day and what's working what's not working how do we make it better and you start to dig into all those pieces of your program to start to clean so your staffing um, how your organization runs. Another area that is really pertinent to our time now is your social media. So if you work with little ones, you might not have social media to connect directly with the little ones, but are you using social media to connect with parents? Are you using social media to share your story with funders, <laughs> with your community, about all the wonderful work that you're doing? We knew before this pandemic we're in a virtual world and that social media can help us, but a lot of us haven't taken advantage of that. So what is your social media presence and how can you clean that up? So um, I'd love to hear from you about some areas you know you need to clean up and maybe some other folks can have some ideas specifically about how to clean, but uh, to be thinking about all the components of the work you're doing and how you can clean that up. 
So after the cleaning, what happens a lot is um, we start to get into this do-it-yourself phase, right? So we've cleaned up the house and now we're looking around and saying, huh, I've been wanting to change my curtains for a long time. I'm looking at my curtains that need to be changed, right? Or like, oh, I always wondered what the living room would look like this way. <laughs> or I've always, I've been looking to do a new backsplash in my kitchen or whatever. I'm not much of a do-it-yourselfer. But let's take that analogy of sprucing up and improving and making things better with our programs. And so this section we're going to talk about staff development, professional development that you could be doing with your teams there are so many ways this can look like. So we're going to talk about some virtual ways because we're all in a virtual world and a lot of online resources that you can be using with your teams. Before we talk about the online resources, I want to advocate for a couple of ideas. The first one is how can you empower your staff to be supporting each other in their growth? And I don't just mean that in an encouraging way, although there's value in that. It is tapping into the strengths and gifts that your staff already possess, the strengths and gifts that you as their leader already possess, and how can you start to professionally develop internally? How can you start to train each other internally? As the leader of the team, my hope is that you know the strengths of your team already. So knowing the strengths of your team, you can start to connect people. So if you know someone who really wants to work on how they facilitate STEM lessons, you know on your team who's really great at facilitating STEM lessons and you can connect them or you can have them do professional development for the whole team. But tap into the knowledge that you already have on your staff, including your own. The other great area we, we have for professional development at this time is giving our staffs feedback on how they are facilitating, how they are having discussions with youth. We all very rarely have the opportunity to witness it and give feedback. Let's take this time to do that. So we can have frontline staff come up with and deliver activities with the team or small small segments of the team and then they get to give feedback okay and they could simulate a lesson that they might do with the kids or they can just do a lesson on whatever they want to do something that they like to cook or some dance move they're going to teach you or how to count to 10 in a language that they know the content doesn't matter so much we want to start to support our staffs and how they facilitate sessions, how they answer questions, how they elicit thinking, how they create time for reflection, how they set up an activity to share what the objectives are, right? So use this time to have staff give activities. It's a win-win because people get to learn something new and people get to practice their presentation in front of other people and to get feedback. It's also a great time to be troubleshooting, right? We all have challenges in our program. How can staff help each other work through some of those challenges that they're experiencing? So now let's go online, okay? You, your staff is sitting at home and they want to, you know, they're by themselves, whatever time they're working, and they want to do some self-development with their uh, professional growth. So the good and bad news about doing this is there's a million ways to do this. So sometimes knowing there's so many options is really exciting, but often knowing there's so many options, it's really overwhelming. <laughs> and so if you say to your staff, well, just go online and do some trainings, right? That might be great for some of them, but for a lot of them, it can be very challenging. So what I'm going to do is share some specific resources that you can share with your team 
This is by no means meant to be exhaustive. I am not um, connected to any of these <laughs> suggestions that I'm about to give to you, but it's a place for you to start. And once you start to uh, experience some of the different trainings, there will be some you like more than others, um, but, but here's a place to start. And before we even get into the frontline training, I have a plea uh, for all of you, which is, all of your staff, whether they know it or not, and some of them don't, are mandated reporters. So just by the nature of working with youth, everybody becomes a mandated reporter. What is really bizarre about that is it's a huge responsibility and there is huge liability collected to that, connected to that. But somehow we don't often spend the time with our staffs to explain what that means. And they need to know what that means for the safety of your youth and also for the safety of themselves <laughs> to protect themselves professionally. So. I don't wanna say all states because I don't know if that's true, but I know for most states, they have online mandated reporters trainings for free. So if you don't do this, do it now and do it in perpetuity. Anytime you hire a new staff, this should be one of the first things they watch. And this is from anybody who's in your program and interacting with your kids. The volunteers, if you are in a school area where you have cafeteria workers, custodians, anyone who's around these kids, they need to know what this means. So look for your state, literally just Google your state and mandated reporter training. Some of them are, are kind of quick and dirty, like 45 minutes. I was on California's site earlier. Theirs is like this mega four module, four hour training. So if for some reason your state doesn't do their own and shame on them, <laughs> then find another state and use theirs um, to, to get your staff the training they need. And if this is something that you do regularly, and I hope it is, but your staff does it once when they join your team and they never do it again, it's a good opportunity for them to revisit. Um, so that's my plug for mandated reporter trainings. But I am going to read from my list because I won't remember this otherwise. And again, if someone can type these as I say them, beautiful. If you can't, I will type these later on. But these are just some of the free. And of course, anything I'm suggesting to you is free. There's lots of paid stuff on there too. But here's a really good place to start. So the first one is the National Center for Quality After School. Get to know them, they're great. They're often listed as SEDL.org, which is confusing because those aren't the letters of National Quality Center for Quality After School, but that's often how you find them. They have what's called an after school toolkit and it is just a ton of online webinars and trainings that your staff can access for free. So that's a really good place to start. Uh, if you are a 21st century site, give me a thumbs up if you are a 21st century site. There is training just for you, you special you, 21st century, you for youth. Uh, if you're not familiar with that yet, those are online trainings that are only for the exclusive 21st century. There's my 21st century folks. Hopefully you're using you for youth. Um, it's you for youth. Um, and I will, it's, I think it's why for why is how the website goes, but I'll follow up with you, Michelle, on that. Uh, also, After School Alliance, they are the advocacy arm of our field. We'll talk at the end of the session about advocacy opportunities, but in addition to the advocacy that they do, they have a lot of free trainings on their website. So please do get to know After School Alliance. Uh, in addition to their advocacy work, they have a lot of wonderful trainings free for you. Uh, for my STEM folks up there, out there, STEM is everywhere. One of the wonderful uh, websites out there that are designed just for out of school practitioners. It's called Click Two Science PD, and the two is the number two. Click Two Science PD, and that is STEM. All things STEM just for out of school time practitioners. So why STEM is valuable, what, um, how you can implement STEM in your programs, particular STEM activities you can, you can put into your programs. So that's a great resource. 
And the last one I'll share, certainly not the last one that you could be exploring, is from the Partnership for After School Education. They're at pacesetter.org, and pace is P-A-S-E, setter.org. Under their, they do do some paid trainings, but if you go into their resource section, they have a ton of free trainings in there for you. So those are some ways for you to get started virtually. You might choose to assign certain trainings to certain team members, or you might give them a list of some of those websites and let them explore and see what they like and what they might recommend to other people. If you're using other online training resources, please drop them in the comments so people can share what they're already using that has been valuable to them. The other thing you can think about during this time when it comes to do it yourself and sprucing up is to start thinking about leadership. The first one, Don, was um, the National Center for Quality After School. It's often um, seen as SEDL.org and they do an after school uh, toolkit is what they call it. Okay, got it, Michelle. So that's the one I just did. National Center for Quality After School, After School Toolkit, S-E-D-L dot org. Okay. Um, the other thing you can start thinking about, we're going to talk again about advocacy and growing the field, is how can you use this time to start building leadership opportunities for your frontline staff? We often employ people who come in um, because they need a job, they might be college students, they're looking for some part-time gig, they're not necessarily interested in the work that we do, but <laughs> if it's a connection, if, they, if we provide them a really wonderful working experience, if they realize that they really love doing work with kids, then we need to find a way to develop and support them and keep them. So it's really a good opportunity to, for you to start having conversations with your team if they are interested in continuing in this field. And if so, how can you start to help them develop their leadership skills? We'll talk later about exploring all the different ways people can, can spend their careers in the after school community where they don't necessarily have to be working day to day in a program. We have to start educating our staffs about what it means to be a youth development professional and all the different ways that that can look. So how can you start to develop your staff and their leadership skills? Tomorrow we'll do a training on um, the four main components of effective leadership. Even if your frontline staff isn't considered a leader yet, or maybe they're not leader by title, this might be a good opportunity for them to start to think about if that's the path that they want to take. And finally, um, this might be an opportunity for you to create some of your own trainings, to have some historical trainings on hand so that when your staff come on board and you're back into the chaos and you're back into running around and not having as much time as you'd like, you can start to have a really well thought out orientation time where you sit with your new staff and say, you need to do this mandated reporter training and here's a training about how to use this database and here's a training about how to do these reports or whatever the case may be. So you might want to start to document and create some training opportunities opportunities that you can use again and again. So those of you who are already doing some professional development with your teams while they're working virtually, please drop your ideas in the box so other people can learn from your ideas. Okay, so we cleaned up the house, we started sprucing it up, we did some do-it-yourself projects, and the next step we'll talk about is getting to know those around us. Okay? Some of us are in situations as we are home most of the day where we are rediscovering the people we live with, right? In ways that are loving and wonderful, in some ways that are making us totally bananas, right? But you are spending time, I've heard from people saying they're, they're eating as a family again, right? They're reconnecting, they're playing games, they're doing puzzles, they're getting to know each other in a new capacity. 
Then you have the folks on the other side of the spectrum who are maybe don't have quite as many people in the house and they might be living alone and um, they're looking for connection with people that they know that maybe they haven't been connected with for a long time. I've gotten a ton of texts and emails from people I haven't heard from in a long time. I've also sent a lot of texts and emails and calls to people I haven't talked to in a long time. So. People are looking for connection, reconnection, and getting to know each other. So the third area where you can really provide some valuable work for your out of school time staff is in getting to know each other, getting acquainted, getting reacquainted, and doing team building during this time. My session yesterday was on team building. I don't want to spend too much time going into all of the specifics, but I, uh, you are welcome to access my training from yesterday or I can follow up with you later with some more specific ideas but this is such a ripe time for you to invest in team building as youth development professionals, we're really great doing this with our youth, right? We do lots of get to know you activities and icebreaker activities and, and uh, program building activities. Sometimes we do these with staff, but there is opportunity now and again, once you go back to your programs to make this a regular intentional part of, of your team development and your program development. We know from experience, we know from research that people who enjoy working together, people who know each other on a more personal level versus just as colleagues or coworkers, it, they work better together. Okay. And so team building is really a way for you to strengthen your program, right? If your staff like each other, they like being there, they stick around longer, they serve your youth better. So there's all kinds of ways to do team building. You can also, again, empower your staff to do some team building activities. They're doing it with the kids anyway, or they should be doing it with the kids anyway. They can start to do these with the other staff. You can do it as a whole team thing. Again, you can do it in small groups. Those of you who are doing a lot of Zoom, uh, I, if you are not aware, you can break up Zoom into up to 50 groups. So good luck with that. I'm not, I, I haven't tried it to do quite that many, but if you're on a big Zoom call, you can break people up into groups and bring them back in. Everyone's going to get to know how to use Zoom really well during this time, but, but have your staff lead those. And then it goes back to what we talked about earlier, where then you, you can not only enjoy the activity, you can give feedback and say, here's how we could have done this better, or here's something I'm, I want to try with the kids. So do a lot of team building as a group one-on-one -on -one. and I want to say not every team building activity has to be an activity okay so there are lots of ways to do fun team building but team building also means team members getting to know each other better. So create space for team members, especially your part-timers who really kind of come in, do the program and leave, right? They don't really know each other very well. Give them time to call or chat. I mean, if they're younger, they probably don't call, but to text or chat or whatever and start to get to know the other members of the team and for them to get to know you and for you to get to know them. So yes, you can have some wonderfully structured opportunities but you can also have lots of unstructured opportunities where um, you can just allow staff to get to know each other. So um, if you're doing some great team building, please drop it in the comments so other folks can share. And again, I have lots of uh, ideas that we spent a lot of time on yesterday that I'm happy to revisit outside of the chat. So we cleaned up the house, we spruced it up and did our projects. We got to know each other better. The next step that a lot of people are doing, they're checking on their neighbors, right? So we're, we've sort of started to get into this new normal, whatever that might be. We don't know how long it's gonna be. Things might change, things might be status quo. Nobody really knows for sure what the immediate future looks like. But once we've kind of gotten a handle 
on our new normal. A lot of us, thankfully, have been reaching out to our neighbors, particularly our most vulnerable ones, to see if they need anything, if they need rides to the store, if they need groceries, uh, whatever. So in your programs, how are you reaching out to your neighbors? And in this sense, your neighbors are your, your youth, your program and their families. How are you staying connected to your youth and their families during this time? I know that there are considerations around confidentiality and liability and how we connect with youth and families outside of program time. So I want you to be very conscious of following whatever organizational policies are in place, whatever laws are in your space uh, or in your state, excuse me. Um, but how can you stay connected to your youth and families during this time? We know from our work that sometimes, and, and this, this chokes me up when, when I think about it, sometimes our program is the only safe place they have, right? Um, sometimes home is, is not the best place. Sometimes school is challenging and something magical happens in after school for a lot of our youth that that's their safe space. And admit among all of the uncertainty and fear and confusion that we're experiencing, imagine that for a kid and then imagine that your only safe space has been taken away, right? It's really heartbreaking. So Unless you have been absolutely told not to, and I hope that is the case, that you have not been told not to, you have got to find a way to connect with your youth and their families. So you can be creative, again, with social media. Of course, our kids are on social media. If you're working with little, little, little ones, that's a different story. I'll get to them in a minute. But if they're like fourth, fifth grade or higher, they are on social media or on the internet in some way, shape or form. How can we use Zoom or other platforms that they might be on? Zoom might be tricky for kids, but a lot of them are using Zoom for activities with their schools. Can you do some after school stuff with them virtually, right? Can you do a STEM activity? Can you do a cooking activity? Can you help them with their homework? Um, a lot of them are doing packets or different things for school. They need help. Their parents might not be able to help them. Can you do something fun for them one-on-one -on -one or as a group? Can you connect with them to do homework? Um, can you have like a sort of homework room where people are hanging out and can ask each other questions? Um, this is sort of old school, but it's a suggestion. You can take it or not. But if you have access to kids' addresses, could you send them a letter? Could you start a little pen pal thing with them? Some kids in this day and age might have never received a letter in their life, right? I, I rarely receive letters anymore myself. But could you send a little note home um, to say, I'm thinking of you. I hope you're okay. Here's a fun little sum activity to do. Here comes my cat, excuse me. Uh, she only wants me when I'm paying attention somewhere else, right? Come on. All right, she's sitting behind me. She might pop up. So how can you stay connected to those guys? That love for my cat, thank you. She'll appreciate that. So, um, you, but you have got to find a way, okay? Unless you've been absolutely forbidden, which I can't see why you would be, find a way to stay connected with your kids, okay? Also with the parents, how are your parents doing? So I mentioned that I'm in Baltimore City. We thankfully have a lot of places where people can get meals. That's not the case everywhere, unfortunately. But um, do they have food? Do they know how to get food? If they need uh, medicine, do they know how to get medicine? Can they get out to get medicine? I don't want you to promise that you can support them in every way because you can't. Um, so I don't want the messaging to be, I'm here to help you with everything everything, right? That's that's not possible or feasible. Here she goes. Um, but if you can reach out to your parents simply to say, I'm thinking of you, how are you? Right? Think about one of those messages you've gotten this week when someone simply says, I'm thinking about you. I hope you're okay. How are you? That goes a really long way for people who are struggling and it goes a long way to building relationships with your parents and families. So 
um, please, if you are already staying connected with your youth and families and you have some ideas, drop them once again in the comments so other people can, uh, can share their ideas of what they're doing. Okay, so we've cleaned up our house, we've done some, some self-improvement, we've connected with our, um, with each other, we're checking on our neighbors. The last area is once we, our own house is in order, we're connected with our neighbors, now we're expanding out, right? And we decided that we want to become part of our neighborhood association. I joined mine a few months back. Those of you in Baltimore, I'm over in Highland Town. I'm a proud member of the Highland Town Community Association. So, you join the community association, right? You want to start making a difference on a bigger level. And this, my friends, is the prime opportunity for you, for you to support the field and its growth on a bigger level. Um, but I just remembered, I forgot to give you some resources I was going to give you. So let me, before we get into advocacy, let me take a step back. So as we're going through the professional development side of things, it's very important that we, we help our staffs understand that our fields this is not right. We fight for our legitimacy of this field all the time that we are not a, we are not glorified babysitters. Right. We've been trying to fight that stigma for a long time. So as we're talking about developing ourselves and developing our programs, it's really important that our staffs understand that we're not just pulling ideas from thin air, that we're not just Googling some art activity because we need some art activity to do that day. Right. Um, this is a great time to build up your library of activities because sometimes we are scrambling a little bit for what activity we're going to do. That's another great way to utilize your staff during this time to just build up this mega library of activities that they can be doing with the kids. But I do... Um, I do find great value in letting them know that there's a ton of research out there about what makes quality programs and about what makes quality staff, and we need to implement them, right? We're in the business. We have joined this field because we want to impact other people. So let's make sure we're effectively impacting the people we're dedicated to serving, and we do that by learning and by being up to date with the research that already tells us, we don't have to do the work, the research tells us what makes quality programs. So I'm going to share some more list of resources for you. Um, if anyone can type them up, great. If not, I'll send them later. You may be familiar with these, you may not, but they come from the big players in the after school space. There are some big players on the national level. What you'll start to see as you go through these resources of what it means to be quality programs, you're going to see a lot of overlap. That's great reinforcement, right? That the research is accurate, that it's telling us the same things. Even though they're separately spending all this money and time on this research, their conclusions are pretty much the same. So we get to use that for our benefit. So here we go. The first one is the C.S. Mott Foundation. They are a huge funder of after-school programs. Uh, if anyone's a C.S. Mott Foundation recipient, please give us a thumbs up. They, I don't know how many millions of dollars that they donate, but they are a huge foundation in the space. They have created what they call the framework for successful after-school programs. Okay, so they've taken this framework that you can use as you are cleaning up your program to make sure that you are, um, you are operating in a way that is research based. Also, the National Partnership for Quality After School Learning, that's a mouthful, what they have created, they've called the 13 Indicators of Quality After School Programs. Okay, so that's another resource for you to check out. Um, the National Institute of Out of School Time, they have something called the Basic Elements of Quality Programming, and they also have something they've uh, created called the Standards of Quality. Um, so those are on a programmatic level, and as leaders, it's really great for you to check out those documents to see what makes a great program, but share those with your team as well. On the staffing side, 
the National After School Association has created what they call the core competencies for after school staff. And they have categorized it. I don't remember exactly. Um, it's like beginner, maybe intermediate, and master for each of these competencies. And it's a great exercise for your team members to say, um, this is what research is telling us makes a competent after school worker. Where am I and where do I want to go? Can you send me an email? I am happy to, Lee, if you email, I don't know if I have your email. If not, I'm at Coach Cat with a K, Coach Cat at KatherineSpinney.com. I'll leave that email in the chat or someone can type it up for me. Um, you can email me or drop your email address and I am happy to send you a list of all the resources. Um, but check out the NAA core competencies as well to help your staff um, on the on the frontline work with youth. If you don't know Weikert yet, get to know Weikert. Weikert, it's W-E-I-K-A-R-T. They are um, one of the preeminent, if not the preeminent researcher when it comes to out of school time and how to effectively um, serve our youth in the out of school time settings. They do a ton of trainings. Some are paid, but they have a lot of resources for frontline staff and um, in what works and what the best research is. So really start to educate your staff that we are professionals too, right? We're trying to legitimize, we're trying to, to credentialize, if that's a word. We're trying to gain respect and understanding of what we do. We're trying to gain more money, if we're being frank, right? And so we do that by showing up as professionals, as using research to inform our work, to do trainings to better ourselves, right? This is how we elevate the field. Okay, I'm glad I, I remembered that I forgot that. So finally, let's go back to advocacy. So how can they advocate for the field? There's a lot of ways to advocate for the field. I'm going to send you back to After School Alliance for a minute. Thanks. Yeah, everyone drop your email if you want to. Hey, Cindy, if you want to um, me to send whatever, if you could be specific about what you want me to send, that will that will help um, as well. So advocacy. So how can you advocate for the field? You can start with After School Alliance. So they do a couple of big things. They advocate for the field and they do a lot of political work. And I don't mean political this aisle, this side of the aisle, We're not going to get into all that. But but they do um, advocating with your representatives, whoever they may be, about advocating for the after school world. And so if you go on After School Alliance's website, they've done the work for you, right? You can go and find out who your representatives are who your Congress people are and you can email them or call them or they create tweets for you of what to say to them and you can um, ask them questions about what they're doing for the world of after school and you can advocate for what you think needs to be done. We are in an election year. Um, Sammy, give me a little more specificity with resources. If you want them all, I'll send them all. Uh, but if there's certain ones you really want, then I'll do that too. Okay, so um, we are in an election year and that is true on the national level. Here in Baltimore, we're in a mayoral election year. A lot of places, um, there's always elections, right? Who's ever in charge, you have your local, you have your state, you have your national, there's always an election going on. So what can you do and what can you start to educate your staff on about how to advocate for the field on a bigger level? So start at the After School Alliance, see the resources they have, but you don't need them. You can have your staff reach out and call and, and social media and write letters to your local state national representatives about what the importance of after school is okay um also, the after school world has two big national uh, events. We just had one on March 4th, which was the March for After School. Um, and we missed that one, but, but we can get ready for next year. And then every year in October, we have the Lights on After School. This year it's on October 22nd. And it's intended to be a national movement where we educate people about after school. And each organization, 
um, is asked to sort of highlight um, what they're doing and what after school um, means. Many times because we are so busy with our own programs, all of a sudden lights on after school pops up and it's like, oh shoot, I think we have to hashtag something. I think we have to write and it's just this sort of um, haphazard way to represent the day. We got a lot of months till October. We got a lot of time and you have staff sitting at home dying for really valuable things to do. So get them on it early, right? Start to talk to them about what Lights On After School is and start to educate them. Don loves Lights On After School, right? Don, if you want to share what you what you do generally for Lights On After School and other people, if you've been doing things, share, share, share. That's why we're here. So employer staff what might what might be a cool idea to do for lights on after school this year they have seven months right to plan it so they can start advocating there um the other area of advocacy that i wanted to mention is the future of the field um I mentioned earlier that a lot of people really love this work, but they don't necessarily want to work with kids every day in a program, or they get to a point where they want to stop working every day with kids in a program. So what are their options? And there are options, right? And so we need to educate our staffs on what those options might be. One of my clients who has been a director in the after school world for years and years, she's absolutely amazing. She's ready for the next step, but she shared with me she was thinking of leaving the field because what's the next step after you're a director, right? So we sat down and brainstormed all the ways you can continue to work in the after school field that don't involve you sitting down with in a program day to day, right? So what does this field look like on a bigger level? So we talked about advocacy. There are people like After School Alliance who spend their entire careers advocating for the after school world. Some do it. It, um, as politicians, some do it as advocates, some do it as lobbyists. But if you're interested in that type of work, there is a great need and space for you to support the field on an advocacy level. You may be interested in switching over to the foundation level, right? You have experienced what it's like to go through grant writing processes, um, how, how programs are funded, what works, what doesn't work. You may have said to yourself, if I was a funder, this is what I would do, right? Now's your chance, or to at least tell people, here's another option. If that interests you, you can work on the foundation side of things. In addition, um, there's some big national after school associations. We've already mentioned National After School Alliance. There's the National Institute of Out of School Time. There's the Forum of Youth Investment. There's a lot of, of national organizations that work on supporting and building the field. You can do it on that level. Every state has their own state after school association, right, where they um, train and support and advocate for after school. You should know your state's state organization. If you don't, that's your homework. Here in Maryland, it's called MOST, the Maryland Out of School Time, but every state has their own. So that you might want to work in after school in that level. Um, some people like Boost and foundations do their big national conferences every year. You might want to work on a conference level. You might want to work on the training and support level, which is where I currently am after many, many years in frontline work. So start to... Um, plant the seed in your staff's mind that this is a professional field. This is a valuable, important, respected field. And you can spend your entire career in it and you can make money at it too, right? Um, we don't forever have to not make money, but there's a lot of options for you to continue to advocate for youth and families if you are ready to move on from the frontline um, work. There you go. So the Missouri After School Network, right? Awesome. Okay, let's take a deep breath. How are we doing on time? Yeah, we are at time. So let me take a deep breath and do a little recap. 
That was a lot, right? So now I told you my goal at the beginning of this session is you would walk away a little overwhelmed, but in a good way, because you have so many wonderful ideas about what to do with your after school staff. If that is the case for you, give me a little bit of love that your head is swimming with all the wonderful ways you can start to support your after school staff. Okay, so let's do a little bit of recap. So we talked about, um, first of all, the value and making sure that our staffs remain paid and employed during this time. We have a field where two thirds of our staff are part time. We can't afford to lose them, but they cannot afford to lose these jobs either, right? So let's continue to advocate for them um, for now, <laughs> for getting through this moment in time, but also for the future of the field. So when we talk about, thanks AJ, so when we talk about cleaning up, how can you use this time to clean up your programs, clean up your hiring, clean up your policies, clean up your employee manual, clean up everything, clean up how your program operates and, and utilize your staff to help you do that. Um, the do-it-yourself project, right? Whatever you're working on at home, how can you help staff with their training? I, I sort of neglected you as leaders because I'm going to pay attention to you tomorrow during our leadership, but how can you continue to do it yourself on yourself? How can you continue to use this time to improve as a leader and how can you share those professional development trainings with them? Uh, after we did the do it yourself, we got to know those around us better. So how are you connecting with your youth and families during this time? You must be connecting with your youth and families during this time. It doesn't have to be a perfect way to do it, right? Just figure out a way to do it. Uh, then we talked about checking in on your neighbors. Um, this can also include, I might have forgotten to mention this, but um, also to include not just your, your youth and families, but also your board, your funders, your partners, your volunteers, right? We don't want to lose all the hard work we've been doing. So maintain those connections during this time. Check on your neighbors. Make sure everybody's doing okay. Work on your team building, right? Get to know your staffs better. And finally, on your advocacy, start to educate your teams about what it means to advocate for the field and what it means to advocate for themselves and their own future in this field. Whew, how's that for a summary? Okay, so I'm going to start to close down. And uh, thanks, Saeed, I appreciate it. So as we start to wrap up, I'm happy to answer any questions people might have. I know we're at time, so uh, if you have to go, by all means, I would love for you on your way out to share something you're walking away with or something you'd like to leave. Also, if you have a resource or idea that you would like to share, please, please do. Um, again, I'm, I'll be sharing this video after we're done and other people are going to have a chance to see it, not live, so they didn't get quite the experience you got, but they will get to see your comments. So any resources, ideas that you have, any lingering questions you have that other people can respond to. So I, I have a level of knowledge and experience in this field, but I don't know everything, not even close. I'm working on my own growth. So we're all here to support each other. Thanks, Jalen. So um, on your way out, I would love to hear what is bubbling. Hopefully there's a lot of bubbling going on, but what are you taking back with you? What are some ideas that got you excited? What are some questions you still have? It's my pleasure, Lee. Um, yeah, send us a little something on your way out, a reboot for your program. Absolutely, Don. We could all use it, right? We all get so caught up in the day to day. We don't often have the opportunity that we have right now. So I do want encourage us to view this as an opportunity, even with all the challenges that are going on. This is an opportunity. So Don says she's going to reboot her program. Beautiful. What a gift that is um, to, to take away from this time. Okay, I'll hang out just for a minute or two, see if anyone has any questions. I'm learning, it actually took me a couple of these to learn there's a lag on Facebook time. So I think you're like 30 seconds behind me or, or something, I'll have to test it out. So I am learning that. Um, 
cleaning your house in every aspect. Absolutely, we could all use it. You know, we, we don't need to take this in a critical way. We all have messy houses. Some are a little messier than others, but we all have those messy houses. So how to clean that up and make our programs even better than before is wonderful. Um, Join us tomorrow if you would like. We will be here talking about the food if specific online trainings for staff. So I'll share those resources with you, Michelle, but if people have other ones, um, I talked a lot about those in the beginning. I'll, I'm happy to uh, share those with you, Michelle, and everybody else. Um, Quality or orientation, Emily. Absolutely. We tend to like throw people in, right, when they start working with us and sometimes um, on becoming a coach. Yes, Don. Oh, sorry. I'm going all over the place. I'm not used to the comments. But yes, Emily. So really being intentional when we onboard staff about how to do it so that they're prepared and not that we're throwing them into program the first day, which is often what we do. Uh, Don, on Friday, we will be doing a session on becoming a coach. So I don't know if you heard that in the beginning, but the universe has answered your call. I'll be here one o'clock on Friday to talk about all things coaching. So I'm happy to send you an email. Um, but if you're able to join us on Friday, that will be a great session for you about how you can become a coach. Um, and for those of you who might not necessarily be interested in becoming a certified coach, but uh, there's a lot of value in learning coaching skills and how to use coaching skills with your uh, with your staff as well as with your youth. So Don, you didn't know we were doing a coaching session on Friday. I thought you were responding that you knew that already. So what a gift to you that we found each other and you can join on Friday to talk about coaching and what that means. So I look forward to seeing you on Friday. Friday. And again, please share this recording with people who may benefit. If, um, if you have some colleagues who couldn't make it but want to experience it live, I'll be doing it all over again at 4 o'clock on Twitter. So you can send them to my Twitter, which is the same handle, at CoachCat2017. I will be doing it all over again. I'll get some caffeine in me in between. I did it on Instagram this morning at 10. This is the great experiment of live streaming. So, um, so you can encourage people to join at four o'clock on Twitter as well. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the work that you do. Thank you for choosing of all the jobs in the world you could choose to do. Thank you for choosing one of the most important, uh, which is serving our youth and families. So um, I'm happy to continue supporting you in any way I can. I appreciate your time in being here today. I appreciate your investment in yourself and in your staff, in your programs, in your communities. I thank you for your dedication to everything that you're doing. My heart and soul is in the after school world. So I hope to continue our connection going forward. Another gift of this time that we, we um, don't just need to make it through this time, right? We can come out stronger than before and carry over our learning back to our programs. So thank you so much. Be safe out there. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day and I hope to see you tomorrow. Take care, everybody.